Hello. Hello. I'm Alex. I'm Val. And we're going to talk about Sopranos. 6B. We're here for 6B. We mm-hmm. made it. We uh, finally... We, I don't know if we thought we would make it. <laughs> I don't know if we did make it. We made it. We're doing okay. it. We're, we're doing it right we're now. We're doing it. Yeah. We're doing it. You're right. So, we're very excited. <laughs> <laughs> and... We're here at some of the greatest television of all time. Mm -hmm. Uh, A pretty important episode, I think, one that gets written up a lot in terms of certain scenes relating to other moments in the finale Mm -hmm. and the the final season. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's it's an incredible episode. I, I really love this one, and I think that there's a lot going on. I think there's a lot of reflection in terms of where Tony comes from, what it means to be a soprano, about power dynamics, um, a lot about character. I love... A lot I'm, about water, a lot about ducks. Definitely a lot about water. We see a lot of water. A lot we, about belts. Yeah, we definitely see like a strengthening of some motives and symbols in this episode. Um, just to kind of get it out of the way, that there's this one scene that... That's where you're going to start? That's where I want to start, because I don't want to talk about it that much, because... There, I, I'm not. I don't want to give any spoilers, and I think that many people who are listening to this have probably seen the show before. And if for those who haven't, I don't want to take anything away. But there is one scene in this episode that gets referenced quite a bit in relation. Is it to, the one where they meet the Canadians at the bar? It is. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> that's the most important scene of yeah. the whole show. Um, for me as well. Yeah, it turns out that this uh, drummer wants to move to Winnipeg. Yeah. And that's no good. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. That's, yeah. Um, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> no, what I wanted to talk about was there's a scene where we see Tony sitting uh, at and the dock. And drinking, drinking a tiny Budweiser. Is this the one where he's drinking a tiny Budweiser? No, that's oh, another okay. scene That's also. another one. <laughs> <laughs> um, the one I wanted to talk about <laughs> is... Tony on the deck and we see him looking out and then we change to his perspective what he's seeing and then there's a bell that rings and then we see his attention go over to the bell and we see a boat kind of rocking in the dock rocking in the wind before that we see the waves kind of moving with the wind that's particularly windy and then we hear the bell go again and then we switch to his perspective which we've established through a shot which which shows us where he's looking and then we see his point of view um, looking at the deck, which has now been settled. So there's mm-hmm. this weird passage of time. I don't want to talk about this too much because there's some great writing on it. And if anyone's interested in how it relates to the final episode, um, it wouldn't take that much to find writing on it and how this does get referenced. Uh, for people who haven't seen the whole season, that's something to think about, that establishment of a point of view shot. Well, we've had that at other times in the show too. It's not, it's used pretty sparingly, yeah. usually. Um, but you know, it has been established as a technique that the team employs. Right. And there's also, um, other conversations in this episode that are referenced in terms of the ending, but I do think it's interesting to think about going forward for the rest of the season, thinking about that establishment of that point of view shot, thinking about Tony in that situation too, like sitting on the dock. There are a few things I do want to talk about that are... Um, maybe different than just like kind of like referencing it to these other moments in the mm-hmm. in the finale, but there is this kind of reflection over the water that's constantly happening, and the wind we've had so strongly associated with the afterlife and death, uh, kind of going through the trees, um, and right now there's also this strong relationship of water to death and waves and waves and this is something that's been happening actually throughout the show like i was even thinking about vin mccasian before he died meeting tony down by this driveway that goes out to the water Mm -hmm. there's um jumping into the water off the bridge there's been other characters there's a strong association with water pussy last shot of season two just being of water there's Mm -hmm. a lot there we had a lot of scenes just of water this episode There's a ton. And even actually like that scene where Tony is contemplating the water and the wind and he's looking at the dock and he's looking at the boat moving and then looking at the boat not moving. When we see him reflecting after that, we can actually see that the wind is moving the trees behind him. So there's also like kind of a a relationship between all these symbols. And it's kind of all coming together and it's really in the foreground of this episode. And I think that these characters are dealing with some 
kind of major questions at this moment and they are contemplating life and death there is actually a really interesting moment for me um when tony sorry in the boat with bobby no not when he's i don't even want to i wasn't even going to bring that up that's not even where my mind's going i'm trying to keep it not obvious there's so much writing on everything um there's you know you can find things but what i was actually thinking of was janice and carmela when janice is talking about this one time i had an abusive boyfriend and i really lost it and he went his separate way and i'm not proud of it Mm -hmm. so through those words she's basically admitting that she killed this guy and carmela is it not ralphie or sorry richie of course it is yeah but the way that she's talking about it that's not clear that it's richie and she wouldn't want carmela to know but she is admitting to carmela that she killed somebody. That's that kind of like coded way of speaking that happens. Do you think in Carmela that gets it? That's a good question. I think she does actually. Mm-hmm. I think she's everybody's caught up in their own life and perspective that people aren't really listening to each other. Mm-hmm. And I think Carmela is capable of getting it and might get it, but I feel like she's not really listening. Right. I feel like she's kind of in her own world. But what's interesting is right after she talks about that, which essentially admits murder, there's this shot of a boat on the water going right, by. Right, that like passes by, yeah. Which is really interesting because uh, very shortly after when Tony is driving with Bobby back from the meeting with the Canadians, he comments on this boat carrying this water skier, right? Mm-hmm. At this moment where Tony has made a decision to pass off a hit to Bobby. Right. And I feel like, yeah, there's this association to killing and death that Janice... Um, kind of possesses and we've seen her actually kill somebody which makes her a different kind of character than Bobby who right. we, who's, who's never who's never killed somebody which is episode. something that yeah. we talk about in this episode and we realize about him as a character it kind of strengthens him as a character and yeah we, we go deeper into who he is but Tony is also kind of coming out of this conflict that they've had in this fight and I think that his way of dealing with it is to make Bobby become somebody else that he probably doesn't want to be and he uses his power dynamic to force him to kill somebody. Yep. And then through the rest of the episode, like when we see Bobby actually go to kill this guy and he's in the laundromat, we actually have that shot of him seeing him, his reflection, in the reflection yeah. of with a gun. There's something that's happening there that's really interesting because, I mean, he's changing at that moment and he's forced to reckon with himself as a murderer, which is something that he hasn't had to do before. So there's some growth there and I think that there's some symbols that kind of tie together these different characters and who they are. Um... It's also interesting because I think that there's a focus in this episode on kind of playing fair and having principles. And it's something that is reinforced for Bobby as a character through small things. Like even through this game of Monopoly that they're playing. There's, he there's likes things, to play by the rules. Yeah. He thinks that, yeah, the Parker Brothers put a lot of work into it. I that mean, free parking. I agree. Free parking is a bullshit rule. Much better game without free parking. It isn't. I it's like, just a game of chance. I, it doesn't turn it into it, a game of the chance Parker Brothers. suddenly. <laughs> it's not like suddenly a game of chance because you get a couple bucks if you land on free parking. Uh, you can get like $500. It depends what your rules are. Depends. Some people put like $500 in there. It's too much. This isn't what we're here to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't a Monopoly podcast. That's coming next, maybe, that, after we finish wow, this. That would be a great podcast. Yeah, 85 episodes. We could be the first to do that. Gold properties, best properties, green properties, worst properties. Oh, maybe you could really do a podcast. <laughs> anyway, where I'm going with this is that um, there is this actual, like, this focus on playing fair and by playing, turning, you know, taking it as a game of skill. And it actually, for me, it kind of ties into Tony, or sorry, to Bobby saying, you Sopranos go too far. Mm-hmm. And, um, being in a situation where he's standing up for his wife, which is, understandable but tony kind of keeps on pushing him and it's kind of unnecessary but bobby does stand in a different place than these other characters because he wouldn't do that and he has principles and tony kind of takes that away from him Mm -hmm. like tony doesn't play fair he's also taking five hundred dollars carmela sees him um well i think that like there's this yeah yeah i think it kind of goes back to what we were talking about last season which is like tony not really being able to tolerate other people who aren't bad like him and I think that's why he gives the house to Janice right like it's this like misery like it's like loving other miserable people and like keeping 
those people close and he can't let Bobby have this like train and hunting world. Right. He wants him to be just as bad and miserable as he is. Yeah. And and I think like, you know, Tony was actually like really upset when they were having that conversation and Janice was like, who would have thought like we would have gotten here like you've really changed. Mm -hmm. And he's like, how have I changed? How am I different? Right. Like he's kind of like trying to call her out on the bullshit. And there's no answer. There's never. He doesn't get an answer. He doesn't get an answer to how am I different. But they start talking about in that moment. They start. He starts to tell this story that he can't get out of his mind. (laughs) Yeah. About this drowning. There's so much about water. It's wild. It's really. There's a lot. There's a lot about water. But I think like, um, that's that kind of like yeah like you know ability to be cleansed or whatever what like all the things water symbolizes in this show at different times Mm -hmm. um i think he's very preoccupied with that um with that concept and he looks at the water and he you know like just sits there staring out at it Mm -hmm. right it's this preoccupation with um i don't know like for me it always ties back into like you know the very basic you know like grade nine symbolism but like water being this like baptismal kind of rebirth thing and i think tony like again tony kind of had this capacity to be quote unquote reborn right we talked about it in season 6a um where (laughs) alex just nodding at me (laughs) um (laughs) where you know he had he had this potential that he could have been rebirthed so to say Um, as this different person. I think like why it brings it up for me in this episode too is because we're also still talking about like family legacies, right? So like actually being born and and Janice talks about her and Tony as infants, right? Right. And how how their mother treated them as infants. So um, I think it is this like, you know, can you, you know, can you escape your genetics? Can you ever become something that you weren't raised to be? Yeah, um, absolutely. Can you ever be reborn as someone else in a different family, in a different place? Like right. Rosa Mesa. Anyways. Interestingly, like the window that we get into their childhood is rather bleak. Like we have these stories of Janice filming, you know, filming Tony and using it to blackmail them. The one um, instant that we get of seeing the Sopranos home movie, you have like this like are kind of like taking this hose and then spraying each other. I mean, like they're just kind of playing around, but yeah. But that story about um, about Pretty? Tony's parents, no, oh. not about Pretty, <laughs> <laughs> um, Tony's parents and Junior and Junior Gumar. Yeah, um, that's a really fucked up story. Like, and yeah. I think like actually, I remember us watching this episode the last time we watched this. Yeah, and talking about this. Yeah, um, like. That is really fucked up. Yeah. Cause and for me, it was interesting that Carmela accepts it. Carmela just it laughs, yeah. right? And that's like the best story she's ever heard. It's like, no, like he shot at her head. Mm-hmm. You know, like it went through her hair. Yeah. By, you know, some kind of happy coincidence, really. Or maybe it was intentional, but even still, that's quite I violent. Know. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. That is definitely pretty crazy. Um, there's so this story. Sorry, I'm very focused on pretty. <laughs> okay, sorry, we can go back. But I to think that deep. that there is this story of this three year old who goes brain dead, drowning in the pool. Mm-hmm. Um, and there is a focus for me on children, on Nika. Mm-hmm. There is like the last scene of the episode is Bobby looking out, gazing over the water like, himself, holding Nika. Nika. Yeah. Nika's looking backwards. He's looking forward at the water too. Yeah. For me, there's this kind of reckoning that Bobby has gone through that Nika is unaware of, right. but perhaps will have to deal with later in her life, just as Janice mm-hmm. and Tony didn't have to as kids, but are now dealing with it as adults. Mm-hmm. This, this kind of... This kind of transformation that that is kind of going to be happening for anybody in their bloodline. Yeah. And uh, the question remains, is it avoidable? Is it inevitable? And I think that Bobby is now dealing with some, some some major questions now that he's been forced to enter the same kind of world that Tony lives in. Yeah, he was really like brought into the family, right? Like there's even a comment like Tony says, like you married her or whatever, right? Like... Mm. He he made a choice to bring himself close to 
the family in that way. Too, right. Right? Um, I don't know what that means about his character or his and it, it's interesting person, because but... it's discussed earlier in the show as being closer to power being something that could like benefit him in terms of his relationship to the boss but then there's this other side of it which is a relationship to the sopranos and the relationship to tony that is kind of like a darkening of his soul and mm-hmm. his being mm-hmm. because bobby is fundamentally a different person mm-hmm. um there's so many like small examples even yeah like this idea of him using a bow and arrow to equalize the playing field when he's hunting against deer and giving Tony an AR-10. Like, you couldn't have a more extreme difference between mm-hmm. between those two things. Mm-hmm. And that's not something that Tony would be interested in. In fact, he kind of demeans Bobby for wanting to use a bow and arrow. He doesn't understand. But there is this kind of principle that exists for Bobby. Yeah. Whether it's in hunting or playing Monopoly right. or not killing people or just generally the way the way he wants to raise his child, but is it inevitable that Nika is going to follow the same Soprano bloodline and end up with the same characteristics yeah. that Janice and Tony have? Well, it's really interesting and it's like well, it's not like the most interesting thing, but it is interesting that Janice kind of <laughs> blames Nika's bad behavior on Bobby's kids. Mm. She blames it on Bobby Jr. Right. Like, oh, she's imitating him. Right. And which is not someone who's, well, I guess, like half in his bloodline, I guess. But like, she's not blaming it on soprano behavior. Right. Which is probably... Probably a, a, a factor. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, so it's Tony's birthday. Yep. And I think that's another like... Again, like going back to the rebirth and the water mm-hmm. and the cleansing, right? Like it is like his birth. They're celebrating his birth. Mm-hmm. Um, he's 47. Mm-hmm. We were asking how old is Tony right. not that long ago. Um, but he, again, like it is kind of like, I don't know, birthdays are often like, I don't know, these like markers of time where you're like making choices about the year ahead of you, yeah. right? And so like, where is this year going to take Tony after his 47th birthday and again it goes back i think to that thing like saying like you've really changed and him asking how am i different mm-hmm. um like what are his hopes for his life he and bobby do i mean i know you don't really want to talk about that no no yeah. but he and bobby do have this conversation right about like being old right and you know 80 percent chance you're going to end up in jail and mm-hmm. you know or you're on the coroner's table or whatever they yeah. said yeah um as boss yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, I just wanted to talk about his birthday. Yeah. The, all this reflection on, on death that they have. That that yeah. line, you probably never even hear it coming, is, you don't is even irrelevant. Hear it. You don't even hear it when it happens. You don't even hear it when it happens. Yeah. Interesting line to choose store your, away. Yeah, choose your words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, pointing that one out there. Yeah. Um, for me, something really relevant between Bobby and Tony is this concept of who won the fight. Yeah. And Tony going in after 4 a.m. and saying, you beat me fair and square. But then ultimately the story kind of changing. Yeah. And Carmela actually even supporting that narrative. Yeah. Saying, like, it was unacceptable that Bobby kind of blindsided yeah. Tony. But this idea that Tony originally does accept that he lost to Bobby, but then he starts blaming it on age. He starts blaming it on other things. And regardless, he still uses his power to reprimand Bobby in a way that he knows will hurt him. Yeah. In fact, he not only uses his power, but he uses his kind of sense of Bobby's weakness and awareness of who Bobby is to kind of hit him in the most personal way where he can affect him as a human. It's really, it's really strong. It's pretty dark. Yeah. It's like pretty manipulative and pretty, um, like the way that Tony can do all those things, kind of like half laughing and smiling. Right. Always really creeps me out. Yeah, it's not good. Yeah. He's like waving at the uh, water skier. Right. And being like, you'll take care of that. You know, like it's yeah. like, okay. <laughs> no, totally. Cool. Um, but that's also, that is his relationship with killing people. I mean, we've seen yeah. him murder at multiple points throughout oh, the yeah. series and we know that he no had... I do, like I more mean act like I'm not as disturbed by him killing people as I mm. am with like the way that he can manipulate others and right. smile about it totally um the other interesting family thing I wanted to just touch mm-hmm. on I mean I'm sure we have other things to say too but um the thing that Janice brings up about her mom being a splitter mm. and I do you think, think she's a splitter 
Well, it's an interesting concept, like, you know, because for a show that's supposed to be all about family and all mm-hmm. about, like, these things that ostensibly unify yeah. families and keep families together, I forget there was, like, some dumb catch line for The Sopranos. Like, some of the, like, have any of you ever watched the, tra- like, the oh, preview trailers? Incredible. They are their own work of if art. If anybody has HBO Go or HBO Now. yeah. You have access to the trailers for every episode. Watch every single one because it is real bad. Yeah, but like there was some. Yeah, they're really. It was they're, a really bad time for TV trailers. They were not made by David Chase, that's for sure. Um, but there, there was like, I remember at one point, like in the advertisements or maybe on the DVDs, there was something like the family that stays right. together. Like it was like some kind of cheesy right uh, catch line or mm-hmm. catchphrase. Um, but yeah, I wonder like, you know, if like looking at Janice and looking at Tony, cause we don't, I mean, I don't really tend to look at Barbara when I'm thinking about the Soprano children, right. although she's fun to think about, um, which of like, which of them do have these characteristics of their mom and their dad mm. and, and which of them would we classify kind of as someone who like hits people against each other, right? right? Which was basically what she was saying. Interesting. That that's was. that's actually that's a really good cash because yeah, because I mean clearly Tony is doing that. Yeah. 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 So. And Janice's relationship with everything is interesting too because it's very it's kind of everything is done with her self protection in mind and her yeah. self betterment in mind. Yeah. Like it's very political actually. She's mostly interested in their power and their stature and their ability to not piss off Tony as boss. It really isn't about him as brother. Mm-hmm. It's about him as somebody yeah, who can Yeah, he's the head of the them. family. He's the head of the yeah. family. Yeah. Yeah. So I I find it interesting, um, that conversation where Tony is is actually talking about how he had to sacrifice his whole relationship with Johnny Sack. Mm-hmm. Because that's something that he didn't actually have to do. And for me, that reference is something that we talked about in a previous episode of why did Tony go out of his way to give something to Janice? Mm-hmm. And I think that's relevant in this episode yeah, as totally. well. Um, because it also plays into that moment earlier where Tony chooses to be mean and put down Janice and he actually actively engages in that Mm -hmm. and that's something that we talked about in terms of like him accepting himself as somebody who would do that um as opposed to being this new person who Mm -hmm. wouldn't engage in that kind of behavior but it really comes up in this episode because we're really kind of putting Tony and Janice and Bobby's relationship under the microscope and it's really it's fascinating because yeah Tony decided to do something kind of altruistic to for Janice yeah. that was not necessary. And why did that happen? And then why does he bring it up? Well, he wants them it to be grateful. Yeah. So that's interesting, right? Because he is referencing something like that he did. I like this is like something we keep coming back to, this Tony giving the house to Janice. I don't think we've ever really even thought about it before. But I think it's really relevant. I mean, it's also this show, every time you watch it, you can have different takeaways. Yeah. But I think it does represent something very important in terms of the Soprano sibling dynamic. Yes. And Tony becoming the character is at the end of the show. Yes. Because I think there is a journey for Tony as a character and he ends up somewhere where there is a certain amount of reflection he's had that's led him to be the person he is Mm -hmm. by the end of the show. Mm -hmm. And I think it's relevant because I think he's doing something in that moment where he does something that doesn't better himself, Mm -hmm. which is out of character for him. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's interesting when he chooses to do that. And it's interesting in this episode where he references it. And it's interesting in an episode that examines Janice and Tony's relationship. Yeah. It was, uh, it was something to think about. Yeah. No, I think again, like, I love this show for that because, again, like, I don't think I was just like, oh, yeah, now Bobby and Janice live in this house. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> great. <laughs> right. I, or, like, maybe even not. Do you know what I mean? And so right. the fact that, like, this, for us this time, for some reason, is this, like, question mark on Tony, like, why did he do this and what does mm-hmm. it mean is really, it's always very interesting. And it's something that's relevant for him, that he stored that away. And the yes. writers yes. chose to, oh, yeah. re- to, to reference that. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And to also 
<laughs> it's interesting. They also chose to reference it in a way where Tony's perspective on it has changed from the time it yes. happened until now. Yes. Um, how much time has passed? Was it a couple months or was it a year and a couple months? And from when to when? From the end of last, from the end of 6A till now. That's a great question. It, how long was the actual time break between these two seasons? I don't know, actually. I didn't look that up right before we started talking. What we have from the beginning of the episode is we have the flashback to 2004. Yes. We have the gun stolen. We knew that there was this two-year break after Johnny Sack was arrested. And then we see a newspaper in the driveway saying that the 2007 budget was passed. So, so maybe we, we're still in 2000. We're still in 2006 we're in 2007. then. No, oh. I think it's the oh, 2007 is that how budgets budget. Work? Oh, yeah. yeah. That, I don't know that how just budgets kind of work. repeated. <laughs> and they were saying like two years ago, blah, 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 which. Right. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. But the passage of time is really interesting in this mm -hmm. episode. There's a lot of moments, for instance, when Tony is hearing the bell, where time obviously passes. But in, in that moment, it's interesting because he looks over, he sees everything in the wind, then he looks back, and then it looks like as he's moving his head back, he's interrupted in that same motion to look back again and sees everything with no wind, mm -hmm. which is impossible. No, so there's something kind yeah. of supernatural about that yeah. moment, which I think we're going to get into with some cat symbols later on or i will i don't know i have some some things to talk cat about symbols. i think there's there's things that are kind of going beyond reality in this season in yeah. a kind of subtle way but i think that that moment there is an interpretation that those things are both happening at once that the wind is there and the wind is not there it all happens in a moment there's also a lot of times where somebody's talking or somebody's carmela's walking up to him and then carmela's in front of him talking to him there's these passages of yes. time where things yes. just skip no, you're correct you're correct and it is not presented in the most realistic fashion things kind of jump around mm -hmm. we have an, an interesting viewpoint on mm -hmm. how the action but is then unfolding. again like in a lot of episodes like this we also have these weird times where we focus on times so the beginning of the episode right before tony gets arrested we see the clock changing to 6 6 a.m right right when he wakes up at 4.04 right. in the morning. like So we do have these like moments that are marked in time right. also that we're dealing with. Right. So. But then also these these moments that are very kind of surreal. Yeah. So just, I, I did just pull it off mm. my phone. Um, Pro time. Just while we were talking. Um, 6A was aired in March to June of 2006. Okay. And 6B was aired in April to June of 2007. Okay. How does the budget work? I'm not sure how that just works. <laughs> so anymore. maybe it is I'm not, I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah. Or, but that's when it was aired. I don't know when it was filmed. You know. Hmm. Um, but it wasn't, it was a year break. It wasn't like that. If we have any listeners in break. Congress, I guess, who want to let us know how the budget works, <laughs> <laughs> feel free to let I'm us know. I'm just imagining a, yeah. a congressperson <laughs> <laughs> listening to this podcast. Well, I mean, yeah. if you're out there, sure. Let us know. Let us know. Let yeah. us know if you're in Congress. <laughs> I guess it's not the highest bar of anything you could do. <laughs> um, I don't know where I'm going with this. Right. Um, anyways, yeah, but it's summer now, mm -hmm. right? Where we left off before at Christmas time, mm. right? Um, we do get a little bit of like beyond those flashbacks to the different viewpoint of Johnny Sack's arrest um, and the gun thing. Um, we do have some other things like suddenly Meadows there being a pediatrician which makes me think that it's a longer gap because mm. was she like at Christmas time so if it's summer now right at Christmas time when she was going to California she wasn't in med school right yet right seemed like she was more interested in law right uh, I think she was I mean it's always that it's thing always she's that. like but law or but, medicine <laughs> but she was going to California to like hang out or whatever well, well she's going to support Finn in dentist. So what's happened? But that is one of those. Right. That's definitely one of those moments where the passage of time happens, and we don't really yes. know what happened. We don't Phil's, have all the details. Phil's been in Florida. Phil's back. Meadows back. AJ works at Beansies Blanc now. <laughs> Blanca's still around, which is I yep. mean, kudos to AJ kudos and to AJ. Blanca. They're sleeping in his parents' bed and right having a pool party. <laughs> Seems pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's interesting how AJ... And jacuzzi. I think that's relevant, too, though, because where we left AJ, things were looking more positive for him when he was working in construction. Mm -hmm. But clearly, that hasn't lasted mm -hmm. either. Now he's working at Beansy's Pizza, and he's also I think lying. I would, like, I would love it if you had that Beansy's Pizza polo shirt that he was wearing. Oh, I would love that shirt. Yeah. 
that's really deep. Like you yeah. really need to know a lot about Sopranos yeah. <laughs> to even understand what that shirt is. Otherwise yeah. you would just look like you were wearing a pizza polo. Yeah. <laughs> but I like it. It's good vibe. Me too. It's interesting to me how when he's talking to Carmela, he lies about being at work when he's actually in yeah. their bed. So, I mean, we have very little of AJ in this episode, but it is revealing for where he is as a character and how maybe he's changed since yeah. we last left him or changed back or reverted or regressed yeah. Yeah. because he seems to be the AJ It's that we were hoping he wouldn't become. Right. At least that's kind of what yeah. was suggested. Uh, I also wanted to talk about this: these two presents that Tony gets, The mm-hmm. Sopranos Home Movie and The Golf Clubs, and the way that they're both presented. There is a different reaction from Tony between the two. He definitely seems to be kind of more excited about The Golf Clubs. We later see him, when Chris calls him, he hangs up on him immediately. That's all we have of Chris. Right. But then we see him bringing The Golf Clubs to the car. Like, he's bringing them back. Yes. There is this focus on the gift, this kind of materialistic gift versus this sentimental gift. Right, that, just a few kind words or whatever Right, they say. Right, well, I guess he says that's all that... And that's what his dad said, too. Yeah. So he's kind of become his dad in some yeah. ways of, like, just saying the same the yeah. same kind of things that, that his dad did. Yeah. But it's interesting in terms of the reflection on what does he actually want, what does he value more. We do actually see him watching the home videos. Yeah, which is actually a pretty lovely gift. Mm-hmm. That actually is. And yet, what do you think he prefers? I think he yeah. probably prefers the golf clubs. Yeah, definitely. Well, because that's, that's too hard to delve into that, right? Like, we've seen Tony throughout this whole show being very hesitant to talk about his upbringing and his family, right? He doesn't want this these stories to be told. Right. Right? Uh, particularly the one where his mom gets shot through her hair, but... Was it know. his mom or was it the Gumar? No, it was, it was his mom. Oh, I fucked up. Okay. <laughs> just want to make sure it's hot remember oh yeah it's, it's hot summer they just make weird slip ups we can't yeah. have the AC on when we record because it's too we've loud we've told them this already we've, I know well I'm just repeating it if yeah. I say something Some, stupid someone told us to, <laughs> to have, a, have a cold drink when we're recording that's a great email yeah yeah uh, I, like I mean I love to have a cold drink when I record don't have one right now I don't maybe either. I wouldn't have messed that up yeah um, <laughs> but yeah yeah, cold drinks are good. Cold drinks. <laughs> um, speaking of cold drinks, Tony does drink a very tiny Budweiser. Drinks a tiny Budweiser. They, I wrote that in my notes. Tiny Budweiser. Tiny Budweiser. Um, they also consume a lot of other alcohol that night. Um, yeah. It's kind of like this bender, which mm-hmm. I like a good upstate bender. It's a great activity, yeah. Seems fun. Um, I mean, not the fighting. Not the fighting, yeah. Um And we see funny differences between the two families in that, too. Like, Carmela comes, and she wants a Pellegrino. And then Janice is like, ShopRite sparkling okay? Mm. Which is really, I think, quite comical. Right. Um, Expensive water. (laughs) (laughs) That's good, actually. I like that. Yeah. Those are my main things. I mean, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of symbolism. I. It's also yeah. just a very... I just wanted, there, yeah. are, there are ducks. There are a lot of ducks. Yeah, And there are a lot. I just wanted to bring it up really quickly. Yeah. After those two bells, when he's on the dock and he's sitting there and he's the point of view with the bells, yeah. we have a duck fly behind him towards the water. Mm-hmm. We don't see it. Like, we don't mm-hmm. see it continue with his point of view, but mm. goes out into the water. Um, and then we have Nika mm-hmm. singing Five Little Ducks. Right. Um, and I think like, again, the ties of ducks and family Mm -hmm. and this kind of like escape, like, you know, kind of this symbol of being able to escape from the family or leave or fly away. Um, I think that was kind of resurfacing itself for me. Totally. In this episode too. And also a reference, uh, like this kind of book ending of the show in general. I mean, we'll be seeing more ducks in season six B. There is kind of this reference from the beginning Mm -hmm. and, and and the way that it kind of drives home this core theme Mm -hmm. of the whole show. Mm -hmm. But that is part of this episode. Can they break this cycle? Did they break this cycle for themselves? Okay. Maybe not, but now we're in a new generation where there's, their kids Mm -hmm. and how will they be able to break the cycle for their kids and maybe that's kind of what we're examining in 6b as they have grown up or now janice has has a child um there's different points 
in their development that they're kind of considering this. But I think that is a really key question. Oh yeah, the other thing that mm -hmm. I think is really key is that they discuss um, building a wall between the U.S. and Canada. Right. Which wow. was prophetic. You know, totally prophetic. I mean, wrong border, <laughs> wrong side of the country. <laughs> but, but just doesn't maybe it. they should. Yeah. Keep out those. We, we also have a well. friend who moved to Winnipeg who's a drummer. So. We do. Yep. Um, he also loves Sopranos. Yeah. He knows a lot about it. He's seen it more than us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he was not murdered by Bobby. Yeah. But we did take a video of that scene where they talk yeah. about our drummer friend moving to Winnipeg and we sent it to him. So, yeah. That's all. That's all. Thank you for listening. We're going to have a lot to say about 6B. We're excited to be here. Thank you for sticking with us and listening. And shoot us an email if you have any thoughts, anything you want us to talk about, anything you want us to look at. And any suggestions for cold drinks that we might want to drink? Any suggestions, any cold drinks if you want to send them? Some ShopRite sparkling. How would they do that? You could ask our address. <laughs> no, just just suggestions for drinks. Just suggestions. Okay, we can get our own drinks. <laughs> We've got it. We're cool. We're yeah. doing great. All right. <laughs> All right. See you next time. Bye. Bye.